Our Father, we thank you this morning for this precious and blessed privilege of being in this hall, of once more having the opportunity to open thy word and to depend upon the Holy Spirit to glorify and magnify the Lord Jesus. Father, we know this message is important because it's important to you. And somehow we sense a great importance upon our own heart and the seriousness of this message. We've known from some time back, Father, that Satan hates this message. He's going to do what he can to distract us, to keep our hearts closed to the truth of it, to keep us from really receiving the truth of your word. We came in faith believing that the Holy Spirit would not help us, but that he would do what needs to be done. He doesn't need me to help him. He can do what he needs to do. And we offer ourselves to him, to thee, and to the Lord Jesus to just simply be used in whatever way you want to use us. May we see the preciousness of the Lord Jesus and what he did for us. May you be glorified in it all. And for those, Father, who are blinded in their minds and find themselves in a snare of Satan, we pray they may be delivered this morning by patient and meek teaching of the Holy Spirit and setting forth the truth of God. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts that can lay hold by faith upon thy word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mike, will you close those doors, please? I'd like to read in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10. Hebrews, chapter 10, which begins reminding us that it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats take away our sins, and then reminding us of the one perfect sacrifice which was made once and for all that did take away our sins. And as proof that our sins have been taken away, he speaks in verse 15 of the Holy Spirit's witness to us and tells us in verse 16 that this is the covenant I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission, that is, where these sins have been sent forth, where they've been forgiven, where they've been laid aside, pardoned, when we've been delivered from these sins and set at liberty from them, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, or by a freshly slain way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. My subject this morning is in the form of a question. It may not seem like a very important question to you, but it's a question I believe to be one of the most important that we can ever understand in our hearts about the work of the cross. The question is where, where is, at this very moment, if it indeed does exist, where is the blood that the Lord Jesus shed at the cross of Calvary? I think this has to be an important subject. I first preached on this in 1959, and like the dummy I am, I assumed that everybody knew as much as I knew, and when I preached on it, I preached on it with great joy. And I didn't feel that I was teaching any believer anything he didn't already know. But for the sake of my own discovery, I had to tell it the amazing truth that the Holy Spirit had confirmed in my heart that the precious blood which the Lord Jesus shed was this very moment 
in the very presence of the Holy God, this very moment sprinkled on God's mercy seat, on God's throne, and is at this very moment doing something very precious for me, and will continue to do something very precious for me throughout all of eternity. When I first preached on this question and sought the answer in the scriptures and found it, at least to the satisfaction of my own heart, I stirred up a storm of controversy. And ever since this subject has ever been mentioned, there's been a solid wall of opposition to it. It cost me the fellowship, quote, unquote, of various Christians, unquote, quote, down through the years. Some of them parted company with me because they said I was too dogmatic. Others parted company with me because they said it was only a trifle and it was unimportant. And uh, to me, it was one of the most important questions that could ever be raised in my heart. Because, brethren, if there isn't any blood anywhere today, we're all lost sinners. That blood has to exist, and it has to be real. It has to be someplace, and it has to be in a place where God can see it. And I have been dogmatic. I won't apologize about that. I have been dogmatic down through the years on this subject and any subject that touches on the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. I'm immovable in what I believe about the precious blood of the Lord Jesus. The Lord reminded me yesterday that uh, Paul commanded Timothy in his last epistle, he said, preach the word. And when he gave that command, it was a sharp military command. It wasn't something Timothy could elect to do if he wanted to. It wasn't something he ought to do and should do. It was something he was commanded by an authority far above him to do. And it wasn't Paul who commanded him. It was the Holy Spirit of God. And he said to this good soldier of the gospel of Christ, preach the word. And then he told him why. He had given him such a command. He said the time will come, the time that was yet in the future when Timothy read this letter. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, having itching ears, heaping them to themselves teachers. They will turn away from the truth. They will be turned to fable. I believe we're living in that time now. And when Paul said preach the word, the word he used for preach, not only a sharp military command, but it's a word which means declare the dogmatic word. The man who's not dogmatic about what he preaches has no business preaching. I don't want to listen to any man who says, some feel it's this way and some feel it's that way. You take your choice. God has called a man to preach. He should know dogmatically what he has to say, and he should say it with a resounding, thus saith the Lord. That's what I intend to say this morning. I'd rather be too dogmatic and be wrong than to not believe anything for sure and with great eloquence say nothing. I am not wrong in what I'm about to tell you. There is no possibility that I'm wrong. What I'm about to preach to you is without controversy. There is no argument, and I don't intend to give any. I don't intend to defend what I believe nor offer you proof. I do intend to declare what my heart knows, what the Scripture confirms, and what Jesus is pleased to keep assuring my heart of day after day after day. Now, you may not think that this question would stir up any opposition, and it may be beyond your comprehension to think that any Christian could oppose such an idea that the blood of Jesus Christ is literally present in the throne of God this very moment while I speak. I wish I could share all of the opposition that came to me down through the years, but it would take too long. But I brought a paper along with me where I have written down some of the remarks that I have heard, and I won't quote any names because most of the names are so well known nationally and internationally that you couldn't believe that I was actually quoting some of the most accepted Bible teachers and preachers of our generation. 
And I won't quote their names because it's not my business to point them out. I just want to give you a general consensus of opinion in fundamental Christianity today about the answer to this question, where is the blood of the Lord Jesus? <coughs> Quoting now from a letter from a man who was known throughout the Christian world as one of the great scholars of the New Testament. He says, quote, however, we are not to understand that our Lord took his blood to heaven. That precious blood was poured out on the cross and dripped into the earth, unquote. Now I'm quoting from a Bible teacher who for 25 or 30 years was accepted as one of the leading teachers in Christianity. This is his comment from the book of Romans. Quote, when I teach the doctrine that God set forth Christ to be a mercy seat through faith in his blood, I never think of the scriptures as speaking in terms of the liquid that circulates in the arteries and veins of man, by which the tissues are constantly nourished and renewed. Now, I do not believe for one moment that there was any cleansing value in the actual chemical elements of the blood that flowed from the veins of Christ. The supposed relics of that blood, of course, are a horrible hoax perpetrated upon the unfortunate people by those who hold them in their power. If someone should ask me what happened to the literal blood of Jesus Christ that flowed from his veins, I would answer, I never go beyond that which is written in the word of God, and since the Bible is silent on the subject, we must be silent on it also. And anyway, to me, it is a matter that is unimportant. I am inclined to believe that the actual blood of Christ went to the dust of the earth like any other chemical element and that it returned to the earth as a part of that earth." Unquote. Now quoting from an internationally known Bible teacher heard on the radio for years and years and years, his simple statement in answer to this question, quote, we do not know where the blood is, unquote. One man wrote me a personal letter when we were corresponding about this subject, and he said, quote, I do not believe the Bible teaches Christ's literal blood is in heaven. The scriptures do not anywhere teach this. You said in your letter to me, quote, you do not believe the blood of Christ is in heaven, unquote, and I answer, I certainly do not believe it is. It is the most unscriptural and unreasonable teaching I have ever known. The book of Hebrews does not say or teach that Christ's blood is in heaven any more than John 3.16 teaches it." Unquote. Another man wrote to me, a man who had been a Bible teacher for 40 years. He said, quote, I do not see that it matters where it is, and as far as I'm concerned, it is a minor matter, a trifle indeed. Unquote. One more. In a personal letter to me, Quote, his blood was completely poured out of the cross, went into the ground, as did Abel's, but it speaks better things than Abel's, namely mercy and not judgment. This question came up just recently when I received a message from another state where a Bible teacher made the same blasphemous statements concerning the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, this is a very, very important subject, and it's a very important question. It would be important on this grounds alone that the Bible is a book of blood. If you take the blood out of this book, you have nothing left. It has no other message but the blood. It's a bloody book from Genesis right on down to the closing chapters of Revelation. If it has any theme at all, the theme is Jesus Christ and the shedding of his blood. It's a scarlet thread that binds all 66 of these books together. The Bible is divided into two sections commonly called the Old New Testaments. The Old Testament is generally divided into three sections known as the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings. 
The law is the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And the very heart of the law is the book of Leviticus. And the book of Leviticus is literally drenched in the blood of sacrifice from chapter 1 to its end. It is the groundwork. It's the foundation that God laid in the Old Testament so that when he announced the mystery of the gospel or the mystery of the good news of Jesus' death, we would have some understanding for our hearts of what Jesus did in his dying and what value his precious blood is to us and to God. And the very heart of the book of Leviticus is the 16th and 17th chapters which unfold the marvelous drama of the great day of atonement. And one of the key texts in Leviticus 16 and 17 is the 11th chapter, or the 11th verse of the 17th chapter, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your sins. The very heart of the prophets is the prophecy of Isaiah. And the very heart of his prophecy is the 53rd chapter. And the very heart of the 53rd chapter of Isaiah is the blood atonement. How God laid on him the iniquity of us all. How he poured out his soul unto death. And remember the life of the flesh is in the blood. And when he poured out his soul, he poured out his life. He poured out his blood unto a sacrifice and for a sacrifice that would put away our sins. And the heart of the writings would have to be the book of Psalms, and to me the heart of the Psalms is the 22nd chapter. It's the chapter he quoted while on the cross of Calvary, if you want to call it that way, or it was the psalm that was written prophetically by David centuries before the Lord Jesus came to foretell what he would suffer and what he would say. And it begins with those marvelous words, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And when we come to the New Testament, we find it divided into the four Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, the Book of Acts, and the Epistles. And you'll find that the very heart of the Gospels is the Gospel of John, and in the very heart of the Gospel of John, it begins with the announcement of God's Lamb, and it closes with the shedding of the blood of that Lamb. And in the book of Acts, that history book of the early church, which records the transition between the dispensation of the law and the dispensation of grace, we have the Holy Spirit through Paul testifying to the elders of Miletus to take heed to the precious flock, the church of the one true and living God, which he said he purchased with his own unique blood. And when you come to the epistles, you find them drenched in blood. Oh, what a bloody book the epistle to the Hebrews is. It's all about the blood of the Old Testament sacrifices and how there was a better sacrifice which fulfilled them all. It tells what happened to that blood, why it is where it is, and what it has done for us. 435 times in the Bible the blood of sacrifice is, is, is uh, recorded. 334 times in the Old Testament, 101 times in the New Testament, and all of them types and symbols and shadows of the one precious blood that was to be offered to God in our behalf by his own Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is an important subject because the writer of Hebrews tells me that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And it's an important thing to me because in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Holy Spirit reminds us that the gospel of the New Testament, this mystery of Jesus' death, is unfolded in the Old Testament scriptures. We would know nothing about the work of the cross were it not for the Old Testament scriptures. 
The epistles Paul wrote in the age of grace to the saints of God, he wrote to tell them of the marvelous results of that atonement. But the gospel is unfolded in the Old Testament scriptures, and Paul says this one gospel which we believe and preach, this gospel which is in force today, is how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and raised again the third day according to the scriptures. If you go back to the book of Exodus in chapter 12, you read the story of the Passover. People of Israel were in bondage. They were a type. They were held in bondage by Pharaoh in the world system. And they wanted to be brought out of this bondage unto a place where they could learn to know and worship the true and living God. And God promised them redemption, and he sent a redeemer. This redeemer, whose name was Moses, came with a message. And the message was good news. But the message did not have to do with some great army that was going to come into Egypt and deliver the people, but it had to do with a simple lamb. A mild, meek, innocent, a harmless lamb. And Moses said, here's how God has chosen to do it. Choose you out a lamb. Keep him up. Watch him carefully. Be sure that he is without spot and without blemish. Make sure he's perfect in every way. And then kill him. Kill him in the evening, in the full sight of the nation. Every family has a lamb. And when this lamb is slain, we learn further on in the next chapter that his blood was to be caught in a basin. And after the blood had been caught in a basin, God gave these minute instructions. He said the death angel is going to pass through Egypt tonight at the midnight hour. And he will pass over wherever he sees the blood. But it was not wherever he saw the blood in, in some uh, indiscriminate place. God specified where the blood would be. He said it must be posted on the doorposts and on the lintel of the houses. He didn't say just kill the lamb and if I see the blood in the backyard I'll pass over you. It has to be put in the place where I tell you to put it. Why was he so dogmatic about it? Because he was giving Israel a wonderful picture story of what Christ our Passover was to do for us in the coming days. So the blood was caught in a basin and out of that basin, dipping with a piece of hyssop, they took this blood and sprinkled it on the, on the doorposts and on the lintel of the house. Never on the threshold, for if it was on the threshold, it would be trampled underneath the feet of those who lived there. This precious, holy blood was placed on the doorposts and over the doorposts on the lintel piece so that every man who entered into that house was safe by the blood of the Lamb from the judgment of God that was to come that night. And when that judgment came, God saw the blood, and he looked for the blood only, and when he saw the blood in the right place, he passed over, and when he didn't see the blood in the right place, he stopped and brought death to the firstborn of that household, and that's all there is to it, because that's what the Bible says. Back in the book of Leviticus, I want to read a verse or two to you, and listen carefully. In the 15th verse of the 16th chapter, where it deals with the great day of atonement, here are God's instructions. The Bible in the Levitical law is filled with instructions about how to handle the blood, what is to happen to the blood, how it's to be taken care of, where it's to be placed, and why it's to be placed there. Now listen carefully. On the great day of atonement, when the high priest was to kill the goat, then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for or in the stead of the people. Here's the substitutionary atonement. This goat, this offering was for the people, and he is to kill him and bring his blood within the vase. 
I want you to listen carefully to the 27th verse of this chapter. And the book for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place, shall one carry forth without the camp, and they shall burn it in the fire, and their skins and their flesh, and they're done. Listen carefully. The body was to be taken outside the gate and destroyed, but the precious blood was to be caught in a basin. It was to be brought in the holy place, and it is there in that holy place, God says, the atonement is to be made. No atonement was to be made at the brazen altar. That's where he died, outside the holy place. But the priest was to catch his blood in the holy basin, bring it into the holy of holies within the veil, and there sprinkle it seven times on the mercy seat. And God said it is there upon that altar that I will make atonement. And again I quote Leviticus 17:11, the life of the flesh is in the blood. I have given it to you where? Upon the altar to make atonement for your sins. Now let me read to you from Hebrews 13. Hebrews is a precious book because it gives us New Testament understanding of what's in the Old Testament types. And in the 13th chapter we have Paul writing verse 10 we have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. Notice how he puts in contradistinction an altar which we believers have, not like the altar of the tabernacle, and those who serve the tabernacle now in the New Testament times have no right to this altar that we have right to. Now we have an altar that those who have no right to eat with serve the tabernacle for the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. And nothing could be plainer than this, than that Paul is stating he's teaching dogmatically that Jesus fulfilled the type of the great day of atonement and though he suffered without the gate, though his body was taken outside the camp, his precious blood was taken inside the veil and into a sanctuary not like the sanctuary of the tabernacle, but into a greater sanctuary and to a greater altar. And in the 16th chapter of Leviticus again, in the 17th verse, a very wonderful verse, God makes it very plain that when the high priest brought the blood of the sacrifice into the sanctuary and into the holy place, he said, no man shall be in that holy place. Just that priest, he must come in alone, and he must come in alone in the presence of God and seek atonement for the sins of the people by the presentation and by the offering of the blood of sacrifice. Now, with that as an Old Testament type, we have a mystery. A mystery I hope to be able to clear up for you. A mystery that's been precious to me for a long time. You don't need to turn in your Bibles, but just let me read to you and you check me when you go home. In the 20th chapter of the Gospel of John, on the morning of the resurrection, we have this dear woman whose name was Mary Magdalene. Mary stood without the sepulcher weeping. This dear woman had come to the garden tomb because, as she said later, they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. She came to see Jesus. She came to find him. She came to hold him, to embrace him, to love him. Now she came to the place where she had seen his body last, and when she arrives, she sees two angels in white, one sitting at the head and the other at the feet of the tomb where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said, They've taken away my Lord, and I know not where they've laid him. That's the greatest commentary on the church business today. That's why the saints of God are weeping all over the world, because they've taken away the Lord, and the people don't know where to find him. Now listen. 
When she had said this, she turned herself back and she saw Jesus standing, but she didn't know that it was Jesus. And then he spoke to her and he said, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom seekest thou? And she supposed he was the gardener, and so she said to him, Sir, if you've borne him hence, if you've taken him away, tell me where you've taken him, and, and, and I'll go get him, and I'll take him away. I want him even if he's dead. And Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. And Jesus saith unto her, Listen carefully, touch me not. The word in the original language means do not detain me, do not hold me, do not cause me to tarry. Touch me not. Why? For I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. I think this has to be one of the most holy moments in the scriptures. Mary Magdalene, as it were, surprised, <laughs> you let me use such a word, the Lord of glory on his way to the presence of God the Father. He was ready to ascend. Yet the strange mystery of it all is that the ascension, as we read it in the scriptures, was not for 37 days. The ascension, if you're talking about that point at the Mount of Olivet, where he lifted his hands in blessing and was taken up into heaven in full view of his disciples, that was 37 days yet in the future. And he said, don't touch me. Don't hinder me. Don't detain me. I have not yet ascended to my Father. Well, it didn't happen for 37 days, yet that very evening when he appeared behind locked doors to his disciples, he was full willing to let them handle him, let them touch him, let them detain him, and they detained him for 37 long days. And while he tarried with his disciples, he spoke to them the things concerning the kingdom of God. Eight days later from the moment he said, touch me not, for I have not yet ascended. Eight days later, he stood in the upper room and offered his hands and his side to Thomas and said, Reach out your finger and touch the wounds in my hands. Take your hand and thrust it into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless. Be believing. He stood there full view and was allowed himself to be examined and handled. And John spoke of him in his glorified body after the resurrection when he wrote and said, We have handled him this word of life. Now the mystery remains for you to solve, unless you will accept my explanation as I give it to you from the scriptures. Jesus was on his way to the presence of God the Father. Why was he going to God the Father and then back again? For he was back the same day. He came back the same day and got back in time for the assembly that night. And he'd made a round trip to heaven and back. What was so vital? What was so important? Why, brethren, hear me carefully. Professing Christianity says this is blasphemy. And I say it is the word of God. At that moment in history, he had not yet obtained something which he had long sought. It's a thing called eternal redemption. And he hadn't obtained it yet in the presence of God. Do you know why? Sacrifice had been made, but the blood had not yet been presented to God, and it was not yet in the right place. I want to read in the eighth chapter of the book of Hebrews, verse 5. Paul writing about the tabernacle and about the ministers of the sanctuary. He talks about the Lord Jesus being our high priest in verse 1, who is even now at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. And he calls him a minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. So Paul evidently believed in a true tabernacle now at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, in which our Lord Jesus Christ is a high priest, and a minister of that sanctuary, 
And he says that all of those who had served in the earthly tabernacle, verse 5, he said, served only unto an outline, only in an imperfect picture or, be, or portrayal, a shadow of heavenly things. And he said that the Old Testament tabernacle had been created and had been built according to a pattern which God showed to Moses in the mount. And this is one of the most startling truths in the Old Testament about the tabernacle that was pitched at Shiloh. It was a building patterned after one that was in the true presence of God in heaven. God caught Moses up on the mount, and for 40 days and nights he showed him the tabernacle of heaven. And he said, the building you build on this earth, it will be a pattern of the true tabernacle in heaven. And the ministry of the sanctuary will be patterned after the true ministry of the sanctuary in heaven. And the high priest's ministry will be patterned after the ministry of my own high priest in heaven, that high priest who is after the order of Melchizedek, the one who had no beginning of days, no end of time, and that one who inherited and had granted to him the rights to the Melchizedek priesthood was the glorified Lord Jesus Christ when he ascended to the presence of the Father after the resurrection of himself from beneath the earth, his body glorified with glory, which he had had before the foundation of the world and his very soul not left in Hades, not left in hell to see corruption, but to re-enter a glorified body and to ascend into the presence of God and enter through the veil into the Holy of Holies and complete the work he started out from an eternity past to do, and that was to find an eternal redemption for fallen, corrupt, vile, ruined, wicked, sinful, hell-deserving creatures like you and I. In the 11th chapter of the book of Revelation, when John was on the Isle of Patmos, and when the Holy Spirit caught him up on the Lord's day and showed him the marvelous sights there in the heavens in the presence of God, he said he looked and he saw the temple in heaven. And he said the door of the temple was ajar and he could see in it. And when he looked in, he said, I saw in the presence of God the ark of his testament. You ever wonder what happened to the ark? Brother, I don't wonder anymore. I know where it is. It's in the presence of God in the true tabernacle in heaven. It's been there for a long, long time. And I submit to you that the Lord Jesus the moment he was raised from the dead, ascended to the presence of God, entered the veil alone, and there in the sanctuary alone in the presence of God he sprinkled his own blood on the mercy seat which covers God's ark. And at that precise historical moment, though the shedding of his blood and the fact of his redemption has been hidden in the heart of God since before the foundation of the world, yet it was that at historic moment that God gave to him in our behalf and that he found for us an eternal redemption. And not before. This redemption was not worked while on the cross. This redemption was not worked in his suffering. This redemption was not worked when he died. This atonement, this redemption, this reconciliation, this propitiation was not an accomplished fact until he carried his blood into the mercy seat in heaven and there placed it before the holy eye of God. And it was there that God saw the blood, not at Golgotha. It was there that God saw the door of heaven sprinkled and now opened for guilty sinners it was there that God saw his altar sprinkled with the sacrificial blood and he saw the atonement made. The only atonement was ever made. 
You say, how did he carry his blood there? I will not be boondoggled in silly questions. I don't have any problems with the virgin birth, and that's far more complicated than getting the blood to heaven. It doesn't bother me one whit when I think of God preparing in a virgin Hebrew maid a special body. It doesn't bother me at all when I think of the Holy Ghost preparing him a special vessel whereby the eternal Son of God could appear among us in the likeness of man. I don't have any problems with how he carried the blood into heaven. I read in the Old Testament scriptures in the book of Exodus and also in the book of Leviticus that this sacrificial blood was caught in a basin. And caught in this basin, the basin was carried in the hands of the high priest into the Holy of Holies. I don't know what kind of a container he used because the word basin means a container. It also means a vestibule and it also means a door. And I'll just have to spiritualize at this moment and tell you that the blood of the Lord Jesus carried into heaven became the vestibule to the presence of God was the bloody door of Exodus 12 fulfilled and he took it there in a container that God himself understands and I just have an idea my ideas aren't any better than yours but I'll throw it out to you like this I believe that in the Garden of Gethsemane the Lord Jesus received a cup. And I believe that in that cup was my sins and my iniquities and my transgressions and I believe that on the cross of Calvary he thirsted for that cup and he took the contents of it into his own body while hanging on the tree. And I believe that when my sins entered into the body of the Lord Jesus that God also made him sin for me though Jesus had known no sin, that I might be made the righteousness of God in him. And I believe that those sins had to have something done with them, that they didn't just dissipate because he died. These sins that were in his body on the tree passed upon him at his death, and so his soul was banished from the presence of God, and he literally died in my sins. He said to the Pharisees, except you believe that I am. That is, except you believe that I am the Jehovah God that you worshipped in Old Testament times. You will die in your sins. Jesus died in my sins. And after he had emptied his cup, it was a cup no man could see. But he had it when he left Gethsemane, for Peter would have defended him. But Jesus answered, This cup which I have received of my Father, shall I not drink it? No one could see that cup. While in the darkness of, Geth of, of Golgotha, he cried, I thirst. They offered him a sponge with vinegar. They offered him a drink, but he refused it for the drink he longed for, the drink he desired to take, was that which he must take in order that I, his darling, his bride, might be saved. He took my sins from that cup, and that emptied that cup. And I think that's what happened when he cried, It is finished. For the conclusion of this message, please turn the tape over. Might be saved. He took my sins from that cup, and that emptied that cup. And I think that's what happened when he cried, It is finished. It doesn't bother me at all to think that just maybe that cup which was filled with my sin 
was the holy basin he carried into the presence of God, filled now with blood. The blood, you see, was in the place of my sins. The blood was in the stead of my sins. And it perfectly fulfills the Old Testament types. For the blood offering of the Old Testament was the symbol of a sacrifice in the place of the sinner. It was proof that the sentence of the law had fallen upon a substitute for the sinner. I don't know of any better vessel to carry the blood into heaven in than that precious cup. But here I will tell you from the scriptures, chapter 9 in the book of Hebrews, verse 12, 11, but Christ, and I'm reading correctly, listen to this wonderful thing, but Christ arriving on the scene as an high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, not of this earthly building. Now Paul says, I'm talking about a more perfect tabernacle. No man's hands ever made it. I'm talking about a tabernacle that stands for good things to come. That's where Jesus is my high priest. And this is what he did in that perfect tabernacle. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. The word obtain means to find a thing sought for. He had been searching for eternal redemption ever since the first lamb died on earth. It is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats can take away sin. But here in this sanctuary not made with hands, in this tabernacle in the heavens, at this altar that is better than the altar of the tabernacle, in the hands of this priest who is better than all the priests, he found what no man had ever been able to find, no priest had ever been able to obtain, no religion had ever been able to discover. He found what had been hidden in the heart of God since before the foundation of the world. He found for us poor, guilty children of Adam an eternal redemption, purchase, buying back. There, when that blood touched down on the mercy seat, Christ obtained for us release from the power and from the guilt and from the penalty of sins. And from that moment on, God has remembered the sins of those who are sheltered by this precious blood no more. He counts them as though they never did exist, do not exist now, and they never will exist for eternity for this redemption is an eternal redemption. One's going to last forever. That's just what it means. I once corresponded with a man about this subject. And he wrote back, and in his impertinence, he said, that verse doesn't teach that Christ's blood is in heaven. And I wrote him back and I said, I agree with you. It does not teach that his blood is in heaven. It says it is. <laughs> and if it doesn't say it is, what does it say? A man must play the fool with words to cover up his own wicked unbelief who can read such a simple verse and say that the blood of the Lord Jesus is not in a heavenly tabernacle sprinkled on heaven's mercy seat. Oh, for more than that, listen in this same chapter at the 22nd verse, or oh, let's, let's say at the verse 18, whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. Why would you think then that the second testament would be dedicated without blood? For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book 
and all the people saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. And then he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens that's the earthly tabernacle, should be purified with these, but it's also necessary that the heavenly things themselves be purified with better sacrifices than these. And so Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands. They're only figures of the true, but he has entered into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Isn't that precious? nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered before the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the age hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. doesn't need any comment. It's precious to my heart. So when the Lord Jesus on the morning of resurrection entered into the heavenly sanctuary, not only did he obtain an eternal redemption for us, he purified the heavenlies with his own blood. And listen to what he sprinkled. He sprinkled the book of the covenant. And that's why this book is precious to me. Call me a, call it bibliolatry if you want to. Call it whatever you will, but this book is precious to me because it's God's word. That's the only book I have that has to do with this new covenant and this new testament which he made and sealed in his own blood. And he sprinkled this book with his own precious blood when he entered into heaven. And he did something else. He sprinkled all the people. <laughs> That's all his people. He sprinkled me that day when he entered into the Holy of Holies. Did you know that? He not only sprinkled the book, he sprinkled me, and he sprinkled the tabernacle itself, and he sprinkled all the vessels of the ministry. They've all been sprinkled with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus. And so, as Peter writes in his first epistle, we have been sprinkled. And that's why we have been sanctified and set apart for the holy use of God, because Christ sanctified us wholly once and eternally when he entered into heaven with the offering of his own precious blood. You know, I've often tried to visualize this. And then I have to go back to the Old Testament to visualize it because that's where the story is told in picture form. And when you read the story of the great day of atonement, all you can see is Jesus. He's everything. He's the altar. He's the sacrifice. He's the priest. He's the scapegoat. He's the blood. He's the mercy seat. He's the Ark of the Covenant. He's the very God that meets between the chariot bends. He is not only that which propitiates, he is the place of propitiation. And he is the one who propitiates. And he is the one who is propitiated. And that's a lot of theological double talk for just saying one th simple thing. Jesus is everything there is to God that we'll ever know. And when you go back and read the Old Testament in the book of Leviticus and you, you read this precious story of the great day of atonement, what a solemn day it was. It only happened once a year on the 10th of October. And the people of the congregation gathered outside the holy confines of the tabernacle location. And there in the full sight of the people with much ceremony and after preliminary sacrifices had been made, the high priest now clothed in a linen ephod and a linen turban came to the great brazen altar where the sacrifices were killed and he brought in his hand this trembling little innocent substitute and taking the sacrificial knife 
He shed his blood. But he caught that blood in a basin as it came from his jugular vein. And then he took the blood and first touched it on the four horns of the altar. And then he started from the brazen altar into the Holy of Holies, the longest walk in the world. The very ground that he stepped on was sprinkled with blood which had already been drawn from a bullet for his own sins. He had already sprinkled the way, all the way into the Holy of Holies, and now he walks on this blood sprinkled way, carrying in his hands the basin. He goes into the holy place, that first great room of the tabernacle, past the golden candlestick that was to burn without ever going out, past the golden table of showbread, which was the food of the priests, and there he stands before the great veil and his altar of incense. He pulls aside the great veil and he enters into the Holy of Holies. Just one single article of furniture in that little room, 15 foot square. It was called the Ark of the Covenant, whose lid was called the mercy seat. And on either end of that mercy seat was a golden cherubim of purest beaten gold whose wings touched over the mercy seat and their eyes ever looked downward at that place where that blood would be sprinkled. And there between the cherubims, God had said, I'll meet with you and I'll commune with you, and there atonement will be made for your sins. He took the blood and without a word he dipped his hands and he sprinkled it seven times on the mercy seat. And God granted an atonement. Now, atonement in the Old Testament sense never means what it means to us in the New Testament sense. There wasn't a word in the Hebrew that meant to make two who were estranged one. And that's what the word atonement means, at one meant. And no sacrifice in the Old Testament could ever make God and sinner one. God and sinner could not be reconciled through the blood of the Old Testament sacrifices. So the very least that was accomplished there and the very most was that the sins were covered for another year. They were kept from all the eye of God for one more year. It was like paying the interest on a promissory note. And when the high priest had sprinkled the blood and had done all God sent him to do, he came out of the great veil and out of the tabernacle and he laid his hands on the scapegoat's head and confessed all the sins and iniquities and transgressions on the living goat. And then a fit man led him away into the wilderness where he never, never, never returned. Now all of this was symbolic of the great work which the Lord Jesus did. For at the cross of Calvary all our sins and our iniquities and transgressions were confessed on him. All were laid on him and he was led away Oh, bless your hearts, this great scapegoat, the Lord Jesus, was led away to a worse wilderness place than Israel had ever known. He descended into the deep, into the pit, into H-E-L-L, -L, hell. For that's where sinners go who die in their sins, and he died in my sins, not that he was a sinner, it was my sins he died in and clothed in his filthy rags of righteousness which he took from me, he descended into the pit and banished from the presence of God, crying, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And God in his faithfulness did not leave his soul in hell nor suffer his Holy One to see corruption, but raised him by his own power and gave him a newness of life and brought him across the great gulf from a torment into paradise to meet the thief just like he promised and to announce to the captives that he's going to take them all home with him to heaven. You know, when the scapegoat was loosed, well, I forgot to tell you that while the high priest, after he killed the sacrifice, he changed into his garments of glory. And when he addressed the people, he came out of the sanctuary in the garments of the glory and he raised his hand and made the announcement that atonement had been made, that God had received the blood in their behalf, their sins had been covered for another year, 
Hey, now for my picture, I've seen in my heart what happened on that day. And the very words that were spoken there, I think, are recorded in the book of Hebrews, and I want to give them to you. The Lord Jesus, when he crossed the great gulf from torment into paradise, he spent those three days and nights <clears throat> preaching the good news to the spirits who were captives, telling them that he had offered his own life at the cross in exchange for theirs, and that he was now going to go to the very Holy of Holies and take his own blood and approach the Holy God in their behalf and search and find something they had longed for lo these many years, a redemption that would be eternal and lasting. And when he was raised from the dead, he emptied paradise and he took all the Old Testament saints with him. And he ascended right up into the very presence of God and Jerusalem itself saw the evidence of it for the graves that held the bodies of some of the Old Testament saints busted loose at the seams and their bodies were seen on the streets of Jerusalem. Isn't that wonderful? And Paul uses this as an argument in the opening chapter of Romans saying this Jesus that I preach is not only the son of David, he is the son of God and I can prove it by the resurrection of the dead. Not that he was raised from the dead, but brethren, by the resurrection of the Old Testament saints from the dead on the day that he ascended to the glory. Why <clears throat> did he take these Old Testament saints? They were the first fruits of them that sleep. And if you'll study the Levitical feasts in, in, in chapter 23, you'll find that the feast of the first fruits <laughs> followed the feast of the Passover. And that the feast of the first fruits when the harvest was about to be taken, the people were to bring a wave sheaf and present it to God as an offering, the first of their fruits to him, that he might bless their harvest. And Jesus took himself a, a wave sheaf and he took himself a first fruit offering. He took the Old Testament saints right in the presence of God. And I want to tell you what I think happened when he got to heaven. He said, you have to wait out here for just a minute because there's nobody can go in there except me. The high priest must go alone. And brother, when that high priest went into the Holy of Holies, he didn't go trusting in himself to be accepted. He didn't go in there trusting in his merits to be received. He didn't go in there with a record of good service for God. He went there with one thing, blood, in his hands. And he had no other hope, and he had no other peace. The thing he had in his hands was the only righteousness that enabled him to approach the holy God. I say it is true of the Lord Jesus as well. He died in my sins. He identified himself with me, the sinner. And God made him to be me, that I might be made him. And when he died, I died. And when God saw him die at the cross of Calvary, he saw me, this wicked sinner, die. And Jesus died, brethren, in my place, in my stead, as myself. That means that when he was raised from the dead and he dared to approach the incorruptible God, he who had been sin and he who had carried my sins in his own body approached as holy God like every other high priest had approached him with one thing only, a basin filled with blood. I submit to you, and I don't care how many theologians hear this message, and you can argue all you want to, you argue with yourself, but you ain't never going to argue with me. The Lord Jesus Christ could not enter heaven on his own merits any more than I can. He couldn't enter heaven because he lived a good life any more than I can enter heaven because I live a good life. 
Once identifying himself with the sinner, he relinquished all right to the presence of God. He gave up all that he was and all that he is. Brethren, the Lord Jesus, do you understand me? Became as me when he died at the cross of Calvary. And if he could enter heaven without blood, so can I. And so can you. He said, you'll have to wait out here till I take the blood. And I'm going to go right into the Holy of Holies, right through the veil. And then we'll do just what God my Father told me to do. I ascend to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. And I believe that he went right in to that very holy place. And I believe he did this. I believe in his entering in, according to Hebrews 2, he sanctified those who are sanctified all at once. And I believe he said to the Father in the sprinkling of the blood, outside are my brethren. I love this. He identified himself with us forever. And I am not ashamed to call them my brethren. I will declare their name. And I declare your name to them. And in the midst of this assembly, I'll sing praises to you. I'll put my trust in you. I and these children who wait without, for you gave them to me. I know they're partakers of flesh and blood, but I took part of the same too. And through my death, I destroyed him that had the power of death over them and who through all of their lifetimes kept him in bondage of the fear of death. Father, I didn't take on myself the nature of angels. I took on something that was lower than the angels. I took on myself the nature of these men who wait without. And I bring to you this precious blood. I offer it for myself and I offer it for them. And I believe that God said just what I told you a few weeks ago in the message. He said, I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied. Propitiated. They're reconciled to me. They can come by me now. I won't remember their sins and their iniquities anymore. I'll never remember them against him. Tell him, come on in. And I believe Jesus went through the open veil because it's open now, brother, forever. And when he went through the open veil, here's what he said to them. Brethren, be bold. Enter into the holiest right now by my blood. It's a new and living way that is a freshly slain way and I've consecrated it for you right on through the veil and you don't need to be afraid because I'm your high priest over the house of God and now you can draw near him with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Your hearts have been sprinkled from an evil conscience. Your bodies have been washed with pure water. And I hear God the Father say something. He says, <laughs> welcome you come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, and to the general assembly and to the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. And you've come to me. I'm God, and I'm the judge of all. And uh, you've also come to the spirits of just men made perfect, and you've come to Jesus, who is the mediator of the new covenant, and you've come to the blood of sprinkling and this blood of sprinkling speaks better things than that of Abel's. Now that's in Hebrews chapter 12, and I don't know how anybody can read that and say his blood is not there, because if his blood is not there, there's been no access made into the presence of God. Well, someone asked me, do you think it's still there? Oh, yes, I do. I couldn't lay down sleep at night if I didn't know it was still there. 
it is still there. One of the reasons I know it's still there is because Peter speaks of his precious blood in his epistle, and he says it's incorruptible blood. And incorruptible blood just has to be someplace. This incorruptible blood has to be someplace, and I submit to you that it's in heaven. And I want to tell you this, that when Paul spoke to the elders of the Ephesian church at Miletus, he told them that this blood was God's own blood. And he didn't use a word which means uh, self. He used one which means his own unique blood. Idios. Idiosyncrasy. We get our word from that. And when he spoke of this blood, he said it was God's unique blood. No other blood like it before, and no other blood like it since. There will never be any other blood like it any place else in all eternity. It is the unique blood of the eternal God. It's incorruptible, it's just as eternal and just as real and just as literal as God is himself and as his own throne in heaven is. And the blood will disappear when God's throne disappears. It will disappear when God himself disappears, and I don't expect that soon. The blood is there this morning while I'm preaching. And it's speaking. It's speaking. The Bible says it's speaking right now to God. It says that it's not speaking like Abel's blood spoke. If you read Genesis 4, verse 10, that when Abel was killed by his brother Cain, you know why Abel was killed by his brother Cain? Well, he's killed because Abel believed in salvation by the blood instead of salvation by works. So that made Cain mad and he killed him. And it says in that chapter that when he was killed, God spoke to Cain and he said, The blood of your brother Abel shrieks, it screams out of the earth to me. Do you know why it was shrieking and screaming? It was crying out to God for vengeance. Crying out to God for vengeance and God heard the voice of the blood. God heard the voice say something. He heard the blood say something. Say, how can blood talk? Well, the life of the flesh is in the blood, brother. And he heard Abel talking to him out of the earth. If Jesus' blood was spilled at Calvary and the earth soaked it up, Jesus is in the earth too. You say, that's ridiculous and that's silly. Well, it may be, but I'm a ridiculous and silly and simple-minded little boy and it's much easier for me to believe what God says than to get caught up in my brains where I don't have any and try to figure out that man has an explanation that beats what God has done. That's a lot of words. Now, I'm a little agitated about this thing. You don't believe the blood's in heaven. You are an infidel. If you deny that the blood is in heaven, you are a blasphemer. If you don't rest in the presence of that blood, in the presence of God, you die and go to hell. Time somebody told you that. Time somebody just stood up and looked you in the eye and said, you're an infidel and a blasphemer and you're lost and you're on the way to hell because to those who believe, they have found something precious in the blood of the Lord Jesus. They know where it is. And that's their only hope and peace and that's their only righteousness. This is what makes the presence of God a reality to me and why I can approach him with boldness and with full assurance of faith. I don't have to shrink back and tremble at all when I think of coming to God because between the Lord God of heaven and my soul, there's a covering of blood there. And in that blood and out of that blood, there is a voice that speaks. And the voice speaks to God in my behalf. It's not Abel now screaming out of the dirt. It's the Lord Jesus speaking eloquently to his Father by the very presence of his blood in my behalf. I like that. I really do. You remember not long ago when I talked to you about 1 John 1 and 7? The blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. And I told you that, that there's a continuous action verb there. And it says in the original that the blood of Jesus Christ is perpetually cleansing. It cleanses now, it has cleansed, and it keeps on cleansing. 
It's an action that had its past beginning, has its present effectiveness, and has its future work. This precious blood, John writes, is moment by moment, second by second, cleansing me and will cleanse me for all eternity because it is ever before the eye of God and the cherubims of heaven who guard the holiness of God have their eyes fixed upon that blood instead of upon me and my sins. That's good news to me. That's why the blood perpetually cleanses me. It's perpetually there. Do you know that when Paul writes in Hebrews and he says, Come now boldly, brethren, by a new and living way, he uses a word which means a freshly slain way. Come by a freshly slain way. And do you know that the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus is just as fresh to the eye of God, just as fresh to the mercy seat, as though Calvary were not yesterday but now, this very moment. God lives, I don't know how to explain this, but he lives in the eternal presence of of Calvary's offering. And we live in the eternal power of it. I died when Christ died, and he lives and I live. And his blood is just as real and just as fresh this moment as it was the moment it was presented there in his ascension to the glory. Now, according to the writer of Colossians, this does something good for me. It gives me forgiveness of sins. It has reconciled me to God. According to the writer of Ephesians, it has enabled me to draw nigh to him. And according to the book of Hebrews, it has given me an entrance, an entree, right in the very presence of God. I will call your attention as I close this message to one last thought. We had a message a couple of weeks ago, and here comes the groom. And I told you how John saw heaven opened. Well, the event that John saw, as far as time is concerned, hasn't taken place yet. But John saw it happening because he was transported from the realm of time to the realm of eternity. And he saw, which is what yet futured us, is yet futured us, but John saw heaven opened. And he saw the Lord Jesus Christ on a great white war horse. And he saw him riding out of heaven. This will take place at the end of the tribulation when he comes with a rod of iron, when he comes to tread the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and when he comes to deal with this Christ-rejecting and God-hating world. When he comes at the battle of Armageddon with his armies following him out of heaven, John looked and he saw this tremendous sight the Lord Jesus and he saw that the vesture the garment the robe that he wore out of heaven had been dipped in blood and here's something for you Baptists to chew on the word is bapto it has been wholly whelmed immersed in blood now, do you tell me that that garment is going to be a garment colored with stained and dried blood? No, it's going to be fresh blood. Well, now, where is this garment going to get dipped in heaven in fresh blood? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, flesh and blood will never inherit the kingdom not any more than corruption can inherit incorruption. So he tells me also in the book of Acts that all men all over the face of the earth have the same kind of blood. It's all corrupted blood, and the blood of no man will ever enter into the presence of God, brethren, because his blood is corruptible. But there is a blood in heaven that's incorruptible, and it's just as real and just as fresh as the very day it was carried there, and into that basin of blood 
the Lord Jesus Christ is going to dip his garment just before he comes. And when he appears, he's going to appear in the bloody robe. You know, the world saw the last of Jesus. You know what they saw of him? The last thing they saw was a bloody robe. They haven't seen anything of him nor he himself since the day the soldiers gambled for his vesture and they wrapped him in a winding sheet and hid him forever from the eyes of the unsaved world. And just like Joseph of the Old Testament, when his brothers who hated him gathered around and threw him down in a pit and sold him into slavery, they took his coat of many colors and they stained it with the blood of a goat and carried it back to his grieving father. It's the last the family of Joseph ever saw of this beloved son until they saw him seated in glory on the throne in Egypt. And brother, at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in glory will be the first appearance he has ever made to the unsaved world since the day they put him in the pit and stained his garment with blood. Next time they see him, he's going to be on the throne. King of kings and Lord of lords. And he's going to wear his bloody garment. And he's going to wear it to the glory of God. And he's going to wear it to the blessing of the saints. He'll never be king of kings to me. He will always be my lamb. He will never be the Lord of lords. He will be the lamb. And he will be my precious bridegroom. And I will be his blushing bride. Only you know... I ain't going to blush. I'm going to be naked and unashamed in his presence. Back in Isaiah, you can read this when you're doing your homework. Isaiah saw him in prophecy too. He suddenly looked up and with prophetic vision, with faith that only God could give him. He said, who is this that comes out of Adam down from Bozer? He said, who is this? I see his garments. They're bloody. How did you get them bloody? And who are you? And the answer comes back. I'm the one who comes in righteousness. And I'll tell you how I got my garments bloody. They were stained when I tread the wine press. The first time I tread that wine press, I did it alone. There was no man to stand with me. This time, I'm going to tread the wine press again, and I'm going to stain all my raiment. And brother, when he comes out of heaven, he comes with garments that have been stained already because he has once trodden the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. He bared that winepress, he bared himself to that winepress at the cross of Calvary, plunged himself into the winepress, was crushed as the true fruit of God, that the life of that true fruit and vine coming from that winepress might be carried to heaven to give life to us poor sinners. And when he comes a second time, the issue will be the rejection of that blood and the shedding of the blood of all those who have defied him. I pass this on to you as a warning. How much sore punishment or how much worse punishment do you suppose a man is worthy who has trodden under his foot the Son of God, and counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done insult unto the Spirit of grace. And I ask myself the question, and I ask the Lord, Lord, ever since I, I've preached this precious truth, I've stirred up such fury and opposition and anger and wrath among professing Christians who have denied that the blood of the Lord Jesus is in heaven. And I said, Lord, why? Why would anyone want to deny that? Why would anyone say that the earth soaked up the precious blood of the Lord Jesus? And the answer I got was very simple. Because, brother... 
when they come to the presence of God, when they are made to come by the blood, it is the end of all their self-righteousness. And they'll have to leave their bloody menstrual rags outside. Because in the book of Jeremiah where God says, all our righteousness is as filthy rags. That's what is described in the Hebrews. And they're just going to have to leave it all outside and come by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the end of self-righteousness. Well, let us look to the Lord in prayer. Father, as the, the men come to wait upon us in this time, we, we rejoice in the simplicity of thy word. We don't understand why men would, would want to find fault with this precious truth. Father, I'm such a little boy, I'm just, I'm glad that the blood's there. I'm glad Jesus is there. I'm not spiritual enough to, to see anything other than what I see in the Word. I just believe that there is a true tabernacle and there's a true throne in, in the presence of your majesty and that the Lord Jesus is in it. And I believe that there's an Ark of the Covenant there with a mercy seat and the blood's on it. I know these, these symbols may mean more than I'm able to comprehend at the time, but until I can comprehend them, Father, thank you for enabling me to just take them by faith. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for shedding your blood for me. Thank you for carrying it to the presence of God and offering it in my behalf, and thank you, Father, for accepting it. And thank you that when you accepted it, you accepted him. And when you accepted him, you opened heaven to him and seated him in your own throne. And when you accepted and seated him, you took me with it because that was part of the deal. He became identified with me that I might be identified with him. He became what I was that I might become what he is. Thank you, Father. And oh, We've never so loved and appreciated you, precious Holy Spirit of God, like we do in these last days. How wonderful it is that you've convicted us and enlightened us and brought us to faith in the Word of God. Thank you, blessed Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We love you so much this morning. And as we partake of this bread and cup, we're reminded that the cup of communion which we now drink, which we now hold in our hands this morning to remind us of the cup he bore. This cup was once filled with my sin. Now it's filled with his precious blood. Thank you. Thank you for the body that bore him. Thank you for the earthly tabernacle he dwelled in. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.